Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is episode 32, and today we have equipment manufacturer Nick Salazar from TriRig joining us on the show. In this episode, we discuss the difference between rim brake and disc brake wheels, frame design, and aero bar design. If you are wondering how your equipment can make you faster, this episode is for you. Hey, this is Chris with Flow. When we're not producing this podcast, our team at Flow is designing some of the fastest carbon fiber bicycle wheels in the world. As a thank you for being a listener of our podcast, Faster by Flow, we wanted to offer you 20% off your next purchase of wheels at flowcycling.com. Head over to our website and pick up a set of wheels to make you faster at your next race or ride. Simply use coupon code PODCAST, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, in all uppercase letters when checking out to get 20% off your order. Thanks again for listening to Faster. We hope you enjoy the show. All right, Mr. Nick Salazar, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Well, man, we're good. We're good. Doing good. You're, uh, you're still in Colorado, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the Denver area. De- so you did you move from... Because you were somewhere outside of Denver for a while, right? Did you move? Um. So technically, I moved, but only about 20 minutes down the road. So okay. I was in a little suburb called Highlands Ranch. Now I'm in another one called Parker. Oh, Highlands Ranch. I, I love that area. It's a beautiful spot. Oh. Yeah, it's great. Nice. So I was thinking before the show, we've, man, we've known each other for quite a while now. Seven or eight years, I think. And I, yeah. think, I think we met when you reviewed our first set of wheels. Is that right? I think that's right. I'm not sure if we met in person right at that time. Um, yep. I don't think I met you guys in person until maybe Kona one year. Yeah, and then um, really, yeah, we've just kept in touch at every interbike and Kona and everything since then. So yeah, it's been it's been fun. But yeah, we know you for. I thought about it. We we're like, man, I've known this guy a long time, which means I'm getting old. That's the, yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Um, so for those who don't know, you own TriRig, obviously, and you manufacture a lot of bike products, and you manufacture everything from small parts. You started with a, a aero bar uh, accessory Great, for wasn't it? no, but your first one was a speed concept. A, uh, like something to make a speed concept aero bar better, right? Chris is correct. Yeah. Yes. Brakes oh, man. Were the second he beat me product. on that one. Yes. Um, yeah. So the first product we made was an aftermarket clamp for the original Trek speed concept, yep. um, the 2009 version, I think it is. Yep. And um, that has flourished into you now make everything up to a full bike, right? So yeah, that's, that's right. Pretty cool. Yeah. You've had quite the journey with that. So, Look, we're both obviously equipment manufacturers too, and and I thought that it would be really cool to have a discussion with you on the show today just to talk about how you see making people faster as a designer and a manufacturer, and we can maybe throw a little bit of our thoughts in there uh, in the mix as well. Heck yeah, man. I love talking shop, and yeah. I love talking shop with you guys because you're way smarter than me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's jump for debate, but anyway, um, but I think before we start the show, there's one thing that I would like to announce. I think it's a first. I think uh, Matt Russell just won Ironman Lake Placid while yes. breaking, not even breaking, he smashed the bike course record on yeah. your bike, the Omni. And that is the first win for the Omni, right? Yeah, that is the first pro. Um, well, it's the first Ironman pro win for the Omni. Um, actually, another pro who actually works with us named Jeremiah Mitchell, he won um, a local try here, but it was just a short little sprint. But yeah, okay. it's the first Ironman win for Omni. And yeah, that was just this past weekend. Um, it was, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I don't think a nicer guy could have won on your bike. No. And, and not only is, is Matt super kind and humble. Um, but one thing I, I love about him is that he is just so interested and dedicated to pursuing better gear and doing the best that he can in terms of his position, his equipment, his apparel, anything like he's always willing to listen and think about how he could be doing better. I mean, he's the opposite of like the traditional pro <laughs> cyclist that's like, no, it is. it has been done this way for 50 years and therefore it must continue. Like he always wants to know what can be done better and he like listens and he takes things into account. So it's, it's awesome working with someone like him because when he looks at your stuff and says, oh yeah, no, this is great. I'm going to do this. You know, it's because he's thought about it. And he really cares. Yeah, no, he's a good dude. And so happy that he uh, made a big comeback from that accident he had. So that's it's great oh, yeah. to see him on your product. Thank you. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, let's. The first thing we're going to talk about today is disc brakes versus rim brakes. And I know you're a rim brake manufacturer. Um, <laughs> I was a huge holdout on disc brakes for the longest time. And I think primarily I was just afraid because I didn't know how to work on them. I knew how to do everything on bikes. I built bikes. We wrote our sure. how to build a 
bike ebook. I had no idea how to work on disc brakes. And then I got into mountain biking and obviously you, you kind of need them in mountain biking. And I've ridden some road bikes with disc brakes since. Um, I see the benefits. Uh, I will say, you know, it's, it's very consistent, reliable braking, but there are some arrow penalties. So let's talk a little bit about the 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 performance of, of all those brakes. Let's get into that topic a little bit. So let's just start with talking about uh, how much of an arrow penalty, if any, do you see or have you studied when switching from uh, a rim brake to a disc brake? Yeah. So with the caveat that we are going to make half of our listeners super angry and the other half probably mildly angry. With yeah, this any... is a very hot topic. <laughs> I will. Yeah. You're very right. <laughs> any discussion we have about this? Um I think it's safe to say that, number one, yes, disc brakes do represent both a weight penalty, which is virtually meaningless, but uh, an arrow penalty, which is substantial and quantifiable to the order of about five to eight watts for the pair on okay. a bike. Um, and those that drag comes from both the rotor and the caliper, but more importantly, from a third element, which is that you need more spokes on a disc brake wheel in order to fight those torque forces. So yep. those spokes are chopping up the air, the rotor is chopping up the air, the caliper is messing up the airflow off the back of the fork. So those are the three sources of the drag. I mean, and that assumes that you have perfect cabling and that your ha cabling hasn't changed, which is not true for all bikes. Yep. Um, some, some bikes now are getting better at hiding disc brake cabling, but that becomes another challenge. So... There are like three or four different ways that manufacturers are hiding the front brake cable for disc brakes. Um, I will say that all yep. these new bikes that are coming out, you've got Ventum's new road bike, you've got the Scott Attic, the 2020, you've got all the BMC bikes. They're hiding every cable, and I just, I don't want to bike with cables now. It looks so cool. For sure. Yeah, it looks way, way cooler. And since they're finally hiding the cables... And there's no caliper up front. The frontal photos look beautiful on these bikes, yes. despite the fact that they are adding a, a an arrow penalty to the bikes. And maybe not compared to the way they were doing rim brakes in the past, mm -hmm. but the fact is you can definitely do rim brakes. So like your best in class aero rim brakes, properly cabled and properly set up, will perform aerodynamically better than the best disc brakes now. And... And yeah, before we go further, I'll mention that, like I said, there are like three or four different ways that people are hiding the front disc brake cable. So the Ventum that you mentioned is using a new FSA headset that the headset has like an oversized diameter that the cable rides inside the headset bearing. Yep. So you need to like remove the headset bearing and adjust things around if you want to like recable or remove the cable or whatever. Um there's versions like Cannondale bike has a removable cover, I think on the front of their system six Evo yep, um, yep. that then, so the cable just sits out in the front and then you bolt on a cover, the Cervelo S3 and S5, it goes like down the center of the head tube, something like that. Yep. Um, they're all different. They're all going to have their own challenges and their own difficulties and they're going to require people to look very carefully at their user manuals, which in my experience, I don't know about you guys, but people often don't read the manual and then they come to you <laughs> and they're like, hey, this thing's not working. And you're like, did you see this thing in the manual? And they're like, oh, I did that. And now it's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, I may have I heard that one. Choice. <laughs> one other thing about the spoke configuration, too, that you were talking about spokes a little bit earlier. You can no longer do a radial build up front either. And that means you have to cross them. So you're not only you're adding more spokes, but you're you're creating a cross build up front. Got it. And that that creates some more uh, some more issues as well. I told you you were smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about improving drag with disc brakes. So you mentioned that it can be as bad as eight watts. So let's say you got a ton of cables, nothing's hidden. You've got poor rotors. Even if let's say take the best disc brake setup. So you've got optimized hidden cables. I know like Shimano Altegra, uh, their disc brake rotors look like complete solid discs now. And they're trying to do that for cooling. But if you look at SRAM's rotors, there's very little surface area. What's like, how good can disc brakes get? If, if eight watts is the worst, what's the best? I mean, like I said, I mean, the, the range that I've seen is from five to eight. And then it depends on what yaw angles you're talking about and how you're weighting those yaw angles. Okay. But I, I don't think you're going to get much better than that. I think, I mean, 
I don't think rotor design is going to make a significant aero difference. I don't think caliper design has the potential to make a significant difference because no. there are certain physical requirements for the caliper that you just can't get away from. Right. Um, moreover, the fact that you have to have these spokes where they are at the diameters that they are, uh, I, I don't see much of a potential improvement. I mean, the best thing you can do is something like what Calfee did with their bike, which is they just kind of slapped on a little aero cover, which will do something to help keep air attached as it passes over the front fork onto the caliper. Although maybe that has a compromise in terms of cooling because you're not letting the air go anywhere. Um, so the short answer, no, I don't see any ways to significantly improve that penalty, but okay. you know, I don't know. You talked a little bit about weight. I mean, I mean, disc brakes are heavier, right? I mean, so yeah, this is super. This is super interesting because um, the reason people wanted to move from alloy brake tracks, which work absolutely as well as the best disc brakes out there, to okay. carbon brake tracks, is to lower weight. And then right. uh, they found out those don't brake quite as well. So I mean, another guy you've had on this podcast, Tom Anhalt, he was. Uh, fond of saying that um, carbon rims were about two innovations away from being optimal. And I think those two innovations could be in a lot of different directions, but those might be superior brake track coatings and or brake track innovation in other ways and different brake pads. Um, yeah. So uh, when you go from aluminum to carbon, you're going down in weight but you're sacrificing on braking performance for really no reason because the weight really isn't an advantage unless you're going point to point uphill, in which case brakes usually aren't very important to you. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but then uh, going to disc brakes, you can leave the brake track carbon, which is what I think manufacturers are trying to make it sound like makes the disc brake so sexy. Oh, look at these car all carbon rims. But uh, don't pay attention to the fact this rotor has to be alloy. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Like carbon right. disc brake rotors is like the most ridiculous thing in all of cycling. It's like we misoptimize three things to sell you a new wheel for no right. reason. Okay. Um, right. So you have an alloy rotor. You have an, a, a relatively heavy caliper. You need to add spokes. You need to add robustness to your hub. Um, so weight comes from all those places. Then you have generally a hydraulic line, mechanical disc brakes are exceedingly difficult to find. No one makes them anymore. Like I think TRP makes a set and I think that's it. Okay. Um, as far as road bikes go, I don't know a lot about the mountain bike world or the um, hybrid world or, or other types that's of gravel, bikes, but yeah. for, yeah, for road and TT, I mean, even gravel, road TT and gravel, you're not going to find uh, too many mechanical disc brakes out there. They're all hydraulic. So yep. you have the hydraulic line, you have the rotor, you have the caliper, you have the additional spokes, you have additional robustness in the hub to accommodate for the rotor. And then you have um, the the hydraulic fluid itself. Um, so you're adding all of this weight. Now, again, as we've said, weight is not important unless you're going point to point uphill. But right. um, what's really important is that they're not going to perform aerodynamically and they're not going to give you any real braking advantage over uh, a properly set up and an optimized rim brake solution. Okay. Yep. So one of the other claim benefits of disc brakes is the ability for other designers uh, to make their components more effectively. And I'll give you a couple examples. So one is example is a frame designer does not have to design the head tube and the fork of the bike to accept a brake. Uh, so that they say that they can get a better airflow in that area. And as, as rim designers, we don't have to worry about designing the brake track. So we have full range of motion and full range of freedom, if you will, to design whatever that part of the wheel we want to be. So with the brake track, you have some shape restrictions where when we take that brake track away, we can do whatever we want. So what are your thoughts regarding the other parts of the bike and how disc brakes affect that? So I, I kind of want to turn that into question real quick. So I okay. never thought, at least for the past, like... I don't know, eight to 10 years that brake track shape restrictions were holding any rim manufacturer back from doing anything, whether so in got, alloy or carbon. Well, well, that's a good question. So you so got that's a couple a question. things. Yeah. So, so 
Well, I'll, 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 I'll grab this one. The, the yeah, first thing is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you look at a, so if you look at our aero charts for anything that we've done, you all, if you compare the aluminum plus carbon stuff and you compare our carbon clincher stuff, the carbon fiber stuff is always faster. Uh, the only exception for that is the disc wheel and I'll address that in a minute. The biggest reason for that is at some point you need to bond carbon fiber to aluminum. You can shape aluminum. Um, it's extremely difficult to do and machine properly uh, in, a, in a round shape. But the biggest issue you have is when you create the bond between the aluminum and carbon, there's always generally somewhat of a lip that exists and it doesn't create as smooth of an interface from one material to the next. So you're, you're going to have somewhat of an arrow penalty because of that lip and the existence of that lip. There is also the component of how the spokes pass through a, um, a fared wheel. Uh, obviously, there's holes cut in them, so the spokes pass through. Uh, a carbon clincher doesn't have that. Now, you can create a structural carbon aluminum wheel, but then you're, you're, you're creating a whole list of other issues. Um, so that's, that's the biggest issue from a, just from a, a materials perspective. Now, when you go out to the full carbon clincher, one of the benefits of a, a rim break or sorry, of a, of a disc break, when you shape the carbon fiber, um, for that wheel, there is no brake track in it. It's, it's smooth. Anytime you start to apply brakes on a disc brake, you're hitting the rotor, you do nothing to the rim surface. If you do that to a rim brake, over time, you alter that surface, it changes, and it creates grooves, it creates scratches, it, it wears the surface down. So you're, you're ultimately affecting that each time you, you hit the brakes. If you're in somewhere like the Pacific Northwest or anywhere where they use you know sand for snow control and it's wet, the minute you start grinding that surface down, you're altering that rim surface. And at that point, you really you are changing the aerodynamic properties of that rim. So um, out of the box, they're very similar, but the more you use it, the more you change and the more you will affect the outcome of the aerodynamic performance of the rim. The other factor, one other factor, is that we are limited by the width of current calipers and how far they open. So I think the current is about 32 millimeters between. So we're not able to really get any wider than that. Today, I would love to be wider than that for several reasons, but those would be the only two limitations. Even on road and TT, you'd like to be wider than 32. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's, that's super interesting. And I've never heard precisely the argument that you just articulated, but one question I have is, have you, have you or anyone that you guys know done testing specifically on, let's say, very, very well-worn carbon rims in the Pacific Northwest or elsewhere um, versus a brand new rim? We've not done brake track testing. We've done tire testing uh, through various sets of, so we took like brand new uh, tires. We made sure they're all from the same mold, same thing. And we went from zero miles all the way up to 250 and 50 mile increments. And it makes a drastic difference. Oh, uh, absolutely. The brake, the brake track study would be actually really interesting. I actually get a, a picture from a guy who was up in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, and he sent me a, he sent me a message saying, uh, the, the bike shop says that my wheel is going to fail catastrophically. And I'm thinking, man, that, that doesn't sound right. He sent me a picture of a, one of our aluminum plus, it was actually our old flow 30 wheel, which is a solid aluminum wheel. There was so much brake track wear that he had essentially worn through the, the brake track. I mean, it was pretty much gone. <laughs> wow. Um, and that's, you know, you're, you're, you're talking several I mean, the, the depth of that does have a, a, that's a significant depth. So it, it would be a very interesting study. We, Chris, we ought to do that next time we go to the wind tunnel is, is wear down some brake tracks and see how much it, it affects it. Maybe we can send him a, a new wheel if he sends us that one so we can study it. We, we, I sent him a new one. <laughs> oh, I did? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so John, um, so let's, let's ignore the differences between aluminum, uh, brake tracks and carbon brake tracks for a moment. Yes. Um, how much do you imagine that penalty may be even over the longest run compared to a brand new brake track? Because I bet you it's not five to eight watts. No. No. But I think if you take into some of the, I don't think you're going to make up the five to eight watts. Um, 
However, if you if you can widen it, there could be some arguments that you could change the airflow off of the rim. You'd have to prove it. I mean, anything in aerodynamics, we have to test and prove. Right. But to make up that five to eight watts, you're right. It's going to be tough. So the second part of your question after that, the brake track and, and so forth, was about design of, you know, frames and forks and crowns. Right. You think we're ready to get there or have we? Yeah, uh, do it. All right. Because you, so, you do both of those. I do. And, you know, I've seen this argument for a while since before I designed a bike. And even before I designed a bike, I was like, wait, well, what are you going to do? And I have yet to see anything that even approaches a simulacrum of an argument for what you can do. Um, so, I mean, at least I think you guys have admitted that in terms of carbon wheels, you can make anything you want, regardless of whether it's a rim or a disc. You're just wondering about the wear of the brake track. And in aluminum, you can get very, very close, but there's going to be some penalty for the transition between materials. Yep. Um, in terms of frame, fork, head tube design, I have zero answers for what we can do. I mean, the only thing that approaches an answer is that you can make the fork crown shorter, which is the distance between the tire, the interior tire surface of your fork. So yeah. the thing that your, the top of your tire would hit if it was too big yeah. uh, and the bottom of your head tube where the fork mounts. So that little distance, you can make that shorter. And Potentially, yes, that's true. That's not always true. So, like, you know, bike makers have been making that distance very short for a long time. Like, the original Shiv Tri, that distance was very short because they used the Shimano, no, I'm sorry, the TRP direct mount standard. So, the brake mounting points were on the fork legs themselves rather than at the fork crown, that right yep. there. Um, so, that distance has been reduced in the past. And, yeah, you can eliminate all bolts or all the mounting surfaces up there, but... As far as I am able to comprehend as a designer, um, the only thing that does is change exactly where the shapes are, not exactly what the shapes are or can be. Um, so when I designed Omni, I didn't make a single aerodynamic concession to the fact that there was a fork crown on that bike. It just changed exactly where things were. So mm -hmm. the, the, the closest version of that argument that would work at all is to say, well... With a bike size of, you know, 48 centimeters, you can make the head tube three millimeters larger if you eliminate the brake mount hole in the fork crown. And therefore, you can make that head tube a little bit stiffer for that tiny, tiny rider. Um, okay. So far, I've, I've never even heard anyone make that argument because okay. structurally, we're still able to make things very stiff and very consistent, even at very short head tube lengths. Yeah. But, I mean, that's the truth. Like, the shorter the head tube gets you know, the more stiffness compromises you're going to make, but also a 48 centimeter rider generally isn't going to be putting out 800 watts. They're going to be right. yeah. a lighter rider putting out lower watts. So exactly. I, I don't know what people are talking about. And like when we test Omni, Omni gets faster when we put on the brakes and then the brake cover um, okay. versus no brake at all. And again, I didn't make any concessions to do that. So I, I don't see how a rim brake represents a design concession or an aerodynamic concession. But, okay. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the end all in the industry and these are just my observations, but yep. Yep. so far I haven't heard any arguments that I'm like, oh, so that's how you get better without using a rim brake. Just haven't <laughs> seen it. Tire and frame clearance. That could probably be a whole episode on itself, but uh, <laughs> probably skip that one for right yeah. now. Um, <laughs> Another nod for disc brakes is the improved braking performance, and particularly when it's raining. Have you done any studies on this rim brake versus disc brake? And if so, can you tell us about it? So I have not done any studies. Um, the closest I've done to studying is um, the studies I've done on our own brakes in terms of how they compare to the ISO standards. So I, I don't have okay. the ISO standards in front of me right now, but there's something like, hey, you need to be able to stop a bike either in the dry so they have two standards. There's a dry standard and a wet standard. And the wet standard, they're actively spraying water right onto your rim right before it hits the brake track. And the dry, there's just no water at all. And it's a standard like something like in the dry, you need to be able to go from 20 miles an hour to stopped in 10 meters, something yeah. like that. Yeah, um, and we've in the done wet, some of that testing as well. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. being a rim manufacturer. So yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And, um, and in the... Oh, 
wait, can I, can I finish real quick? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go, go nuts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that test. And then in the wet, obviously you get a little bit longer, uh, or at least that's the ISO test from yeah. the very first version, very first pre 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 production prototype of our Omega break. Um, we were beating that standard by like half the distance. And that thing was very poor at modulation and it had much lower strength compared to any break we've actually sold to the public. When we're ready to certify the break, we don't have to do a pre-test to be like, hey, are we making it? Because we know we're going to absolutely destroy the standard. Like yes. you can lock up our 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 you can lock up your wheels with our brakes at any moment. You can modulate all the way down from nothing to locked up very, very well, as long as the brake is properly installed and you've got the right equipment. I mean, like, and, and that is to say, if you have an alloy brake track, you should probably be using the cool stop salmon pads that we supply with the brake. And if you have a carbon rim, you should use the pads that came with your rim or that your manufacturer yeah. specifies for the rim. Yep. Or if you're using a no name Chinese, like, or sorry, not to disparage any country, but uh, a no name rim with no certifications or branding or any kind of testing or warranty behind it, that you should be prepared to understand that that may not be the best wheel on the market. And so, thank if you you're for uh, bringing up that people should use the brake tracks that the manufacturer suggests. Yeah, that's a good no, one. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's massive. Like, if you, yeah, I mean, like, so flow wheels have a very nice thick carbon brake track. I think your your brake track walls are something like two or two and a half millimeters thick, which is much yep. thicker than most carbon clincher brake tracks in the industry. But that makes a significant difference because it helps dissipate heat. Yep. And then you have never had a heat failure. Yeah. And and yep. your pads work very, very well. I'll say the same thing for uh, zip. They also coat their brake tracks. They have a little texture on there. They have a specific brake pad compound that I believe is made by Swiss stop for them, for their rims. Those also work very well. Yep. Um, and yeah, not to like throw around competitive names no, out there. No, it's fine, but man. We, totally we, had, fine. Uh, we had Neil Shirley from Envy on our show, so yeah, we, yeah. we totally don't care. <laughs> but, but that's the point is like, if you have a solution that's optimized, you install the brake correctly, you do it right, it will work brilliantly. And like, yeah, people who are like, oh, carbon rims suck. It's like, oh, what do you have? It's like, well, I got this thing off AliExpress and I'm, I'm using these pads that I found under my couch. And it's like, well, yeah, no wonder. And it's like, who installed it? I don't know. Like, yeah. In your opinion, I mean, disc brakes right now are kind of like a big technological push, not only from a frame manufacturing, but from disc brakes in general. It's yeah, just the uh, industry. And in the industry in, in total, what is your opinion on them? Do you think they're necessary? Do you think it's kind of uh, a fad? What, do you, what are your thoughts on it? And why is there such a big push? Well, the, the latter of those questions, why is there such a big push? Uh, in my experience, it's been a, a very strong push from two specific manufacturers that have a whole lot of clout and influence and push in the industry that basically said, hey, we're all going to disc brakes now. I mean, we've been hearing about disc brakes on road bikes for at least eight years. Yeah. And yeah. then over the last like 18 months, it was like kaboom. Um, and in my opinion, it's because these two manufacturers were like, hey, this is what's happening. Um, and we have the clout to make that happen for you. And so these two component manufacturers, which I won't name, but you might call them S and S, um, <laughs> they basically made it happen. And I've heard from a number of other frame manufacturers who are not myself that they are completely against this decision, that they have been fighting this decision for years and now they feel like they don't have a choice. Yep. So, I mean, that's just happening. I don't know what your experience has been because I have never heard, you know, a massive push toward we must have disc brakes now. And I don't know if your customers have all been like, oh, we must have this. We need to sell them or if. Yeah. So I'll give you an example, actually. So yeah. when, when 11 speed came out, that was kind of, I don't know, maybe a year into us selling wheels. 11 speed was this new thing. And we thought we had to place an order and we said, we said, okay, well, we'll just place an order for all 10 speed and we'll buy some, a few extra 11 speed free hubs. And, you know, as people slowly start to adopt, we'll add them. In our first order, we had like, I don't know, eight or nine people ordered 11 speed out of a few hundred. And then our next order, 
like 300 people ordered 11 speed and we, we were changing all of the free hubs by hand which was a horrible thing to do that sounds tra- fun that was great yeah, it was great um so we <laughs> the the adoption of 11 speed and now you've got sram access coming out and every, like we're getting so many emails on that but that that happened overnight disc brakes like you said i mean people have been talking about that forever and we, we released our first disc brake wheel I don't know, two years ago now or whatever it was. And we thought that the adoption of that would be really, really quick as well. And that has been really slow for us. Um, Shocking. I, yeah. I don't know Shocking. If, if, I don't know if it's because we have a large triathlon following. Um, you know, we, we sell to road as well, but we've, we've kind of sat on some of our, our disc brake stock. Uh, not because the product's bad. It's just the, the, the market hasn't demanded it like they've demanded rim brakes from us. Yeah. And I think that you've got another factor as well. I think as manufacturers start to move towards a disc brake, you know, OEM wheel, they can do more with the rim. Uh, it's easier to put a carbon rim on out of the box because they're not worried about heat. Uh, those rims are typically cheaper. And so you're getting stuff now out of the box that's that's already carbon. And so then to go buy a carbon set is a, is a little bit of a different situation. Um, so those are, those are things I think that impact it as well. But yeah, I would definitely say that it's a slower transition to disc brake. And I think it leads to a question, you know, from your perspective, what percentage of the population do you think has made that switch? Well, so I, I don't really have an idea about that. I think that would be in the like, you know, single digit percentages um right for sure probably under five but a- another interesting point you just brought up john was like okay the the out of the box wheel for that bike is carbon but typically it's like 45 millimeters deep because they don't want to offend right. anyone who can't handle the bike or is worried about it <laughs> right and then so the person has just purchased this fourteen thousand dollar bike with these shallow rims so not only yep. do you have the arrow penalty of the disc brakes themselves but now you have these worse you know these worst performing rims and how likely are you to go buy a brand new set of deep dish disc wheels right in our experience so, not very likely right <laughs> you know it, this is this always brings up i mean i have this conversation on a regular basis i, I actually had a guy i was talking to this morning about this concept and he said you know i, I bought a bike and it's got the standard oe wheels and you know i i, I break spokes all the time and people think that when they've never ridden a wheel, and this may sound like a sales pitch for us, it's really not. I'm just talking about how wheels are built. But, um, but the truth is, is that out of the box, a standard OE wheel is as cheap as they can make it because they're trying to put as much margin in the bike as possible. Right. That's that's not necessarily a bad... Unless I'm it's not, an Omni because you know who we stock. Flo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to make that like the the bike brands are doing a bad thing. But what you get is you, you have to adapt to a, a general population. And so when you reduce the spoke quality, spokes are one of your main components that will break or wear. What you end up doing is you put in more spokes and you basically overbuild the wheel trying to compensate for the sport, poor spoke quality, but then you don't customize the wheel for the rider or the weight range or power output or any of that sort of stuff. And so you end up getting a subpar wheel that breaks a lot of spokes. Right. And I think, you know, as you start to move away from, from rim brakes and you start to move towards disc brakes and you, like you're saying, you're put, you're putting a carbon wheel on there, but you're like, you're, they're not trying to, it's, it's generic. And so they make it in that 45 mil range. Uh, it still really isn't a customized wheel for that individual. And that's why I think that, you know, over time, I, I think you're going to, you're going to move into the same direction of, you know, people will still want to purchase something that's more fit and more suited for them. Yeah. I mean, and, and all these things that we've just identified are just issues of, you know, they're not the the high level, what's the best case versus the best case scenario. It's like what's happening right now. And it kind of reminds me of the move for 3D television sets. Like the 3D, the TV industry was like, you are going to have a 3D television and every TV out here is going to be 3D and we're going to sell you these glasses and we're going to make so much money off you and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> and like the minute that happened, I was like, 
this is going to fail like miserably because <laughs> this is the worst experience ever. Like I never go to 3D movies in a theater because there's just like so many problems with it. Like it cuts the brightness in half. It's annoying. You have to wear these stupid glasses. Like you can get motion sickness easily. Like I do. I think like a third of the population does. And like, so everyone was like, screw this. We don't want 3D TVs. Those stopped being manufactured despite the fact that they still show them in the theaters. No one makes a 3D TV anymore. And like disc breaks, it's not the identical scenario, but it's I think it's similar in that the industry is like, hey, here's this thing we're telling you is better. It's going to be an upcharge. You're going to have to spend all this money. And then, I, I mean, you guys haven't seen a huge, like, overwhelming, like, oh, yeah, let's get this right now. Like, yep. you've seen like a, huh, that's neat. And, and other, I think other manufacturers have seen it, a, d- a different take. Like, I know uh, Joe Stanish from Envy, you know, I've talked with him and we, I told him that we our adoption was pretty slow and he said that surprised him. So I think companies like Envy have a bigger rate but i also think that most of their customers are mountain bike you know (laughs) yeah so right so but so they they clearly have their mountain bike product but even with road their road adoption has been faster and but but i think that's probably because their customer bases started with mountain biking so a lot of people who are going to buy envies are already comfortable using disc brakes does that make sense yeah yeah but i also think as well that you know from from an envy perspective they do a lot of oem Stuff so they're, they're putting that too. stuff on bikes, right? So, if larger companies are starting to push that out, that would uh, that would automatically increase their uh, disc brake percentage for a company like us that's typically all aftermarket. Maybe we have to have not. Jake on so he can tell us whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, uh, like the other thing you mentioned, like Axis, you're wondering whether you're going to have to put XDR drivers on all your wheels. Like, I am hugely bullish on Axis. It's amazing. Like yeah. I've been testing it recently. I think it's the best thing. Like it's my favorite drivetrain ever. And like, is it really? Oh, I mean, there's like a, there's a cost issue, and then there's the issue that you need to like definitely carry some batteries in your saddlebag. But they're very small batteries, and they're easy to get and whatever. But I haven't uh, pulled the trigger, we, but I'm so close. Oh my god, we I ordered, love it so much. We ordered five of those free hubs. Probably I don't know, maybe middle of 2018. Um, they sat in inventory for months and months you'd pick one off every once in a while and then they all sold in the same month and then all of a sudden it's like i need to order more so i order all right i'll order 10 i'll double it i needed to order like 30 to 50 in yeah. like the next couple of weeks it's just it's exploding <laughs> at the moment yeah. i mean no, it's cool it's awesome and it's it's the same thing you know it was xd and then it went to xdr and i'm like you know the, but right. I, xdr is a, is a is a pretty cool concept yeah like is this um, a new bb standard or what yeah, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, since this show is about being faster on your bike, what do you believe is the fastest brake setup? <laughs> huh. <laughs> um, well, no bias. I mean, honestly, I've <laughs> tested a lot of them in the tunnel and it's, uh, I mean, I'll sound like a total shill here, but we always win. Tri-Rig always wins. Um, <laughs> okay. And as far as I understand, um, a lot of other manufacturers have taken our brakes to the tunnel to test against their system. So now let's, okay, let's eliminate our brake system. So the, the best brake setup I think that's out there is Tri-Rig Omega X brakes front and rear of a Tri-Rig Omni. The system all works together beautifully and brilliantly. And it's not only the most aerodynamic, but it also has like superlative braking power and modulation and it'll work on carbon or alloy brake tracks. But let's take that out of it. <laughs> Trek has long done a fantastic job with their brakes on the speed yeah. concept, and they've improved it from the 2009 to the 2013 model. Argon 18 does a very, very similar brake, and they do fantastic with that. Um, you know, people look at the Canyon bike and think it's basically a clone of the speed concept, and it has a lot of similar features. I'm not a big fan of that brake. It's really difficult to adjust and install. Um, and going back one, the Argon 18, it's fantastic up front. The rear one is a bit of a bear to deal with. Um, but I mean, those I, I think would be the best ones out there. Like if you properly integrate a rim brake into your bike, um, it, it's the best thing out there. Now, you know, we're always working on new product. And so we may or may not have something in development that's even better than our current braking product in the works. Um, that, you know, you know, certain shapes, if you do them right, they can make a bike faster than having no brake at all. Right. Um, exactly. But that's all I'll say yeah. about that so far. So, I mean, right now we have <laughs> the Omega X and then if you add our Delta front cover, that makes the bike much faster than no brake at all. 
Um, and that's not just true on Omni. Like we, we put that on a P2 and it had the virtually exactly the same result. Okay. Um, huh. So you get the right shape. You can make the whole thing faster than nothing at all. Yeah. And Interesting. That's cool. All right. Let's switch gears. Let's talk right. about frames. Um, let's talk a little bit about frame design since you're also a bike builder. And in the last decade, we've seen companies start to depart from the very restrictive UCI legal frame. So the P5X, the Ventum 1, the Tri-Rig Omni, and Diamond would be a few examples of that. So why do you think companies have started to step away from building UCI compliant frames? Because for years, nobody wanted to walk away from that world. Um, and I'm sure there are many reasons. I think the market is a big part of it in triathlon. But why, why do you think people have started to walk away from that? Yeah, I mean, certainly the market is probably the biggest driving factor. Like the UCI, I think it was like 1998. Um, they banned all non-triangular shapes for UCI events. And the market was very, very driven by UCI compliant bikes for a long time. I think you would call this the Lance effect. Um, people wanted what US Postal was riding or something similar. And I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. When I mean, regardless of your opinion of Lance Armstrong and U.S. Postal, I mean that when people see heroes on the television and they want to mimic them, I don't think there's anything wrong with that per se. Right. Um, and so that's finally started to change and triathlon, I think, has a little bit of its own market independent from uh, like the Tour de France market, basically. I think that has established enough that it's the case. Um, and so I love, I love, love, love that we see all these different ideas coming out. Like, yeah, they compete with the products that I make, but I'm so happy when I see them. Like any of those, any of those things that you mentioned, the Ventum one, the diamond, um, the, the new P5X, the new P3X. Like SIPO was one of the first companies, right? Oh, not to make a beam bike or a, something that was non-triangular. They, they, I think they said... Like screw the 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 dimension the ratios the three yeah. to one they're like yeah. we're just gonna make what we want I think they were one of the first they they were definitely early on in that um, specialized also was I mean they were like in two thousand nine with the the shiv or maybe yeah. that was oh, I'm sorry twenty eleven I think yeah. Um, yeah so talking about shapes what led you to the shapes that you use for the omni so I've long been a student of those kind of radical frame designs that existed both in the past and the present. And there, there are lots of different ways to go. So if you're, if you're going to say, I don't have to have all these frame members, there's lots of different ways to go. Um, the three most notable of those would be the beam bike. And in the past, those would be like your soft rides or your zip 2001. Yep. And in the present, those would be like the diamond or the P5X, P3X. That's category one. Category two is more like no top tube, which is like the Pinarello uh, Paragina. That was something Jan Ulrich rode. Um, yep. The 1996 GT Superbike, maybe 1994. I don't, I don't know if I have that year right. Uh, the GT Superbike that just had no down tube and really tries to flush, sorry, no top tube and tries to flush the down tube right against the front wheel. Yep. That's a really compelling idea as well. And then idea three, which is what I wanted to go after because I thought it was the most compelling of all of those, is what I call a monofoil design. I haven't heard anyone else really coin a term for it, but um, so, and that's something that, for want of a better term, eliminates the down tube, but uh, m more subtly, it creates a single foil shape that goes from the head tube back to the rear wheel with no the interruption. The old Lotus was the first example of that, right? The so cheetah. I don't know if that was the very first. So the Cat Cheetah is one example. There's a Hata bike that is similar. The Karima Fox is one of those. Um, Giant made a version called the MCR. Um, a guy named Bursford made one for himself for his um, track efforts. Uh, that gentleman's passed away, but the the Bursford Superbike is another example. Um, Lotus is certainly the most famous of those. Yeah. And so interestingly, they, so Lotus has historically named their projects numerically. And so they mostly make cars, but their 108th project, the Lotus 108 was a bike. Then Lotus 109 was a car again. And then Lotus 110 <laughs> was another bike. So there are two Lotus bikes that have a monofoil design. Most people are familiar with the Lotus 110. That is okay. a road bike. Um, 
you can slap components and brakes on it and that top two you know it has a it has a top tube like section that goes straight back horizontally and then that become that merges into the sort of seat tube area so visually that will look closest to your ventum one um we i wanted to design closer to the lotus 108 which was the track bike that they made for Chris Boardman to compete in the Barcelona Olympics where he yep. set uh, a record and won the gold. Um, so that monofoil shape goes down at an angle, sort of smoothing the transition from head tube all the way back to the rear wheel. That's what I was most interested in pursuing. And that's that was the original inspiration for the Omni. I mean, people will look at these bikes and say, oh yeah, that one's just like that one but only with radical designs. They won't do that for double diamond bikes. They won't say, oh, the speed concept's just like the Cervelo P5 because they're both double diamonds. No one ever says that. But right. when they see radical shapes, they're like, oh yeah, because I am able to recognize patterns in my life, I'll just say they're identical and not actually look at the details. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so stepping away from those constraints at the UCI, um, how has that allowed you to improve the aerodynamics of your Omni? So... The goal, the aerodynamic goal of Omni in terms of the frame members is to lead air as smoothly as possible from the leading edge of the head tube back to the rear wheel with no additional leading edges, trailing edges, or interruptions. Okay. Um, and so that was kind of the the idea and the goal. And that's basically what we achieved. So that's that's part one. You get that super smooth airflow. You can actually draw an aero cord from the head tube to the trailing edge if you use a disc wheel that's uninterrupted all the way trailing edge of head tube back to the end of the disc wheel no interruptions okay. i don't think there's any other bike out there right now for which that's true okay um and so it's not horizontal it's at a slight angle but you can move the wind vertically to some extent with tube shaping okay and, and aerodynamically how has that turned out for you in the tunnel we, i've never tested anything that tests faster than omni ever okay um we had stuff that's definitely good or in the category, but nothing's even been within like two watts of it. And I'm sure we don't have to get into every detail of this, but I'm sure you have like a white paper that explains your testing protocol somewhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, in the store, so on tririg.com, if you click on any of the products that we make for anything where we have um, information about tunnel testing, we have easy links there. It'll okay. be like aero data or whatever. I'm John and I both are pretty big sticklers on protocols and wind tunnels and you've just seen i've seen studies from other people sometimes you have the independent studies that go in and oh i know you what you're write, about to like, say <laughs> you write an email and you're like hey how'd you set your tires up yep. <laughs> i find like 300 watts of error in their tires alone yeah. Yeah, you know no, no. it's like look man you, you know I, I i i'm gonna say this but i get a kick out of the people who think that the manufacturers are like the big bad wolf who's out there to get you and it's like right. no 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 if you would have called me and told me you're going i would have loaned you my two thousand dollar pressure sensor so you could have done it right like i would have just yeah. rather see good data out there than have people be mis you know misrepresented or whatever and yeah. i think i would gladly do a test with zip and envy but i don't think they would ever sign up for that but i i think it would be a fun experiment to go and you'd learn something i mean some of the the greatest lessons we've learned are from people at competitive companies who you call and behind the scenes are like, Hey man, check this out, try this out. And it works. Right. So, um, I, yeah, no. I, I think there's this misconception that we're all like, you know, s scheming to, to convince people that to buy our products, but really we're just trying to find like good, at, good data, you know? Right. No, I mean like, um, morph the, the, the arrow bars that fold up and yes. go from base bar to bar. Um, you know, very sadly the founder, Frank, um, passed away, passed yeah. away. But he was always super straightforward. Like he published testing data that compared to our bars and he was like super straightforward about it. And I was always like, hey, what do you need, Frank? Like when he wanted to exhibit his bars, I was like, hey, you're exhibiting on this kind of standard bike. Do you want to put them on the Omni instead? Like we'll get you an Omni all set up. And he's like, yeah, that's absolutely great. Like, no, yeah, yeah we, we he's making cool stuff. He's being innovative. Uh, and we want to help like, yep. and, and you guys taught me those lessons about wheels and tires long ago. So like every test I've ever run, there is only one wheel set. Yes. Uh, there's one wheel set with one set of tires on it and it gets pumped up every couple tests to ensure that it's still, 
at the right it pressure. Goes on every bike, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if like, you so, go back and you want our pressure sensor, we can send it to you. <laughs> thank yes, you. We'll gladly loan that out because our first pressure sensor came from a competitor, and it was like, hey, thank you, you know. So, um, I've only ever used my my Silka pump, but it's it's the Silka Ultimate, so it's not the worst. You know, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> no, not going to compare to yours, income. but it's very good. And yeah, I only ever awesome. use valve extenders, so that taking the thing off. Uh, so taking the the chuck off of the valve extender doesn't result in me losing 10 psi when I do it slowly or whatever. Oh, you know, it can. Five to 10 psi is not uncommon when you. Well, but he's them. saying he's using a tube valve. Sorry, extender, I'm, so yeah, I'm, I'm using. No, just, no, uh, no. I yeah. know, and that's why I'm saying it is important to be that yeah. careful because it yeah. can result in a substantial loss. Yeah. Yeah. No, I never yeah. use valve extenders that move the core out. I I don't I don't want to see the core ever. Like yeah. I just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So every so, test I've ever run has been that way. So knowing that you, you know, there's all these new shapes of bikes, is it is it safe to say that a standard, you know, double diamond bike that's got a front triangle and a rear triangle, is it is it safe to say that they're they just can't compete with the new shapes? No, that's not safe to say at all. And there's still very, very good double diamonds out there. Um Cervelo just came out with their new P5 disc. That bike looks fantastic. Like okay. my gripes about disc brakes aside, I think that's a fantastic looking bike. Um, and I'm sure that performs extremely well in the tunnel, even against anything else. But there are there are other advantages to radical shapes, particularly the monofoil type shape of Omni, which we were able to test as well. So one thing, and I've never seen other manufacturers publish any data about this, but I think it's extremely significant, is that... Um, your side forces and your side torque can be much, much lower if you use something other than a double diamond. So, and those are the forces that are wanting to turn your wheel against sort of the inputs you're giving it or blow you to the side. Like if it gets really windy, blow you off the road. Um, you know, we recently tested against a pretty good double diamond bike, uh, versus our Omni and found like 30% lower side forces and side torque which is just massive. It means yeah. that like while you're we, riding in the wind, you're not going to get blown around as much. Yeah. So we have an optimization algorithm that we use. And one of the components of that algorithm is actually yaw torque. That's what we call it. But yeah. it's it's preventing. So we, we could design this super aero wheel, but if you go down the road and it's bucking you around like a Bronco, there's no point, right? So we always have to have, I mean, it's, it's a weighted, so it's not super high in there, but we always want to yeah. make sure that we're designing with that in mind to keep yeah. people able to control their bike, you know? I should say I've I've never seen data from frame manufacturers about that. I have seen it uh, from wheel manufacturers and good wheel manufacturers like you guys are considering that. Yeah. Uh, but I've yeah. never seen a frame manufacturer talk about it. And they're like, you know, look, our down tube is 150 millimeters deep. And it's like, well, what does that do to handling? Or like, I, you know, I, hmm, without naming a name, like <laughs> beam bikes that have a really deep down tube are gonna give you a lot more side force and side torque because yeah. there's just more area for the wind to hit okay like if you look at the picture of matt russell riding his omni uh you'll see as he's riding you don't see much of the bike and that's because it mimics kind of the shape of his body and the frame members kind of hide behind his body and so there's yeah, not much it right now it's on it's on the homepage of your website yeah there you go <laughs> so there's not much for the wind to hit that's how we're able in part to lower those forces so okay. if there's nothing that the wind's going to hit, then those forces are just going to be lower. It's just passing right through. Interesting. Okay, so before we get into aero bars, what is the t what are the top three pieces of advice you can give an athlete listening uh, when they're purchasing their next frame to make sure they're getting the right bike? Uh, number one, make sure you have a good bike fit. Thank you. And That's the most honest <laughs> answer you can give. I, yeah. I wanted that answer to come out of your mouth, and it did. So good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> make sure you have a great bike fit. Uh Hmm. Let's see what's two and three. I've, I haven't, I didn't. Uh, make so just sure think of guys looking yeah. to go faster. So no, one, no. you gotta, yeah. you yeah, gotta yeah, yeah, be yeah. fast. So you get a fit. So, okay. Get your bike fit. Number two, make sure you can iterate that fit over time because mm. th there's so much discussion in this industry about your bike fit as this like shining city on a hill. And when you hit it, you're there and that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no athlete from the first time age grouper to the multiple time world champion who just has their fit period. And that's the end of it. 
Like yeah. every single rider can benefit from iterating their fit over time, finding out what's a little more comfortable, what's a little faster, what's a little aerodynamically better if you have the means to test that kind of thing. Do you know um, Ivan O'Gorman? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I had a bike fit from him uh, last, last, about a, six months ago, seven months ago. And he, he said that to me. If you know Ivan, his his accent makes everything funny. He's, he's awesome. He's a very funny guy. He's amazing I just guy. love listening to him talk. I know. <laughs> he's the best guy ever. But he's just like... You're never going to, he says, it's always changing. Your body's changing. You're, if you have an injury or, you know, your muscle tension changes, you get tighter hamstrings or whatever. It's always changing, yeah. right? So that's a very good point. So that's two. What's three? Uh, make sure you look you get good. Really good wheels. Yeah, yeah, make sure you look good. <laughs> yeah. Was that Nick that said that? <laughs> the, uh, John said wheels. I said look yeah. good. <laughs> look good. Oh, yeah, you got to look good. That's half the battle, right? Yeah, no, I mean, shoot i mean if you fit and you're able to change that over time then yeah man make sure you look good for sure yeah you know, <laughs> it, as 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 uh cliche as that may sound i think when you buy something that you just really like you just you you enjoy it more i yeah, remember the first yeah. guitar i ever bought i just skimped on it i'm like oh it's cheap and i bought this one and i just hated the guitar yeah. and i just I tried to like refinish it myself and it turned out to be this disaster project because I have zero patience for fine detail stuff. And I ended up selling it at a loss and then bought the guitar I wanted and I have I still have it. I bought it like, you know, 20 years ago and I still have it. But um, yeah, get what you want, you know. Yeah, dude. And- like, yeah, if you're a pro, there's a longer list of what's important in a frame. If you're an age grouper and you're not making money off this, make sure you f- it fits, make sure you can move it if you need to, and then make sure you like it. You like how you like look it. on it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You're not spending 10 hours a week on your bike because you don't enjoy the process. So enjoy the process while you're doing yeah. it. That's good. Yeah. That's good advice. Uh, let's get into aero bars. Um, Boom. This is kind of one of your strong points, I'd say. My favorite you, topic. Yeah, I bet it is. So I've heard you say something a little while ago and it kind of stuck with me. You said your aero bars are your home when you're riding. And that really couldn't be more true. And I I went, I don't ride triathlon bikes much anymore. I used to do tries and now I do uh, mountain bike racing and some, some road stuff. But I I remember when I was on a triathlon bike all the time, your cockpit is super personal. It's like your desk at your office. Like it's like, oh, this has to be here. And I want this here. And I I was meticulous about it. So, um, Talk a little bit about that. And as an aero bar designer, what are some of the key elements to consider when you design an aero bar? Yeah. So I have always just been obsessed with aero bars from like when I very first started try in college. Uh, like I was always looking at what bars were out there, what people were doing, like what was coming out in the industry. When the first S bend extensions came out in something like 2003, I think. Um, with U.S. Postal riding the head S-Bend extensions, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the thing. That's the new thing. I must have them. I got like serial number six or something off of there. <laughs> like I, I refresh their website every day. Like it kept saying they're coming soon, coming soon, coming soon. Like I would refresh it like 10 times a day and then finally found it, bought the first set I could. Like I was obsessed. Um, and, and so what I think is important in a cockpit has changed a lot over time. Like at the beginning, it was like, I need it to look exactly like Lance Armstrong's cockpit. And right. I need my arms to be this way because then on the S-Bend, I can kind of use that as a point of leverage and pull up and whatnot. Um, like these days, it's a lot more of what I just said about frames is that it needs to not only fit, but be able to iterate your fit. Um, yep. So... Uh, you know, I've, I've talked about our Alpha One Aero Bars as the most important product I've ever made. Um, and, I, and I absolutely believe that because it just lets you use your bicycle in a way that you never have been able to before. Like in general, if you're out on the road and you're like, you know, I like this fit, feels pretty good. I just, I wish I could try five millimeters lower. You have to go home and you have to spend anywhere from 40 minutes to four hours making that change happen. Yeah. And that, that just means that most people aren't going to make it happen. They're never going to try that. Um, or, you know, much more extreme changes. Like, hey, I want to try something wild. I want to go down 20 millimeters. I want to go forward 10 millimeters. And I want to tilt my arms way up. You know, I've, I've yeah. heard this fitter tell me that more reach is now the thing. I want to see if that's comfortable for me and if it works. Yeah. Like, it's never, ever, ever going to happen if you have 99% of the aero bars on the market. Yep. So... For me, like that is the most important thing. Make it easy to iterate that fit. Make it done with the fewest bolts possible um, and make it so people will want to do it, want to try it out. Like 
This is yep. easy. It's always accessible. You don't have to take things off to do it. Just here's these couple of bolts. Go nuts. Okay. So this is a bit of an aside, and this is kind of a, a, a pet peeve of mine, but why do manufacturers not list the stack and reach of their bars? Because I, wh- <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've had a handful of bikes over the years, and I have a, a bike I have on a trainer, and I have a you know a bike that I ride on the road, and transferring fit is is tough to do. I have a system now that's pretty awesome, but I don't understand why manufacturers don't list the stack and reach. Do you have any idea why that is? It's just they don't know or I, how is that not standard? They might not know. I mean, sometimes they list something, but it's a fair amount of work to translate into what the actual fit numbers are. Like I've seen like white paper documents with three pages of quote unquote fit data that don't actually let you learn the stack and the reach yeah there's like fibonacci sequence to like figure out how to transfer your 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 fit from one bike to another yeah it's like makes buying the bike this guessing game yeah i'm looking at you 2010 bmc time machine um (laughs) you you had one of those right i that's the bike that they didn't list any specs on and i'm like i love bmc don't get me wrong like that i i have never ridden omni so i can't say but i have a bmc time machine that is one of the best bikes I've ever ridden. It's just amazing how they put that thing together. But when I was trying to transfer my fit, I'm like, guys, stack and reach would be so great in that right now. Like, I knew- well, we, we have these 47 stem positions. We don't tell you what they are, but here's what they look oh, like. I know. Anyway, it was that was that was the yeah. bike I was referring to. But outside of that, that bike is like hands down yeah, amazing. For sure. It's great. But yeah. it, you know, it can be some work to generate those tables and make them with, you know, robustness and consistency and then like that's one of the very few things i've outsourced not generating the table but um i asked for some help from someone to make a javascript that would allow us to make the fit guides that we have on the site so i was like here's what the variables need to do here's how they go like i just are awesome by the way so good job on that thank you yeah i just don't i don't write a lot of javascript so he gave me something that was like 99 percent there and i kind of you know crossed the finish line but sweet um sweet it takes a bit of work to do that and to do that like, you know, to, and make it work. Um, and especially like to say like, okay, here, we're going to build this database of bike stacks and reaches so people can do it. So I don't know why other manufacturers don't do it. Um, Cause to me, that's also a no brainer. And to me, it's also like uh, from a just laziness standpoint, avoiding a lot of customer service emails. Yeah. Like, sorry, sorry, my, my <laughs> pet peeve inventing just went on a total ramp there. But anyway, yeah. that's besides the point. No, like I built it so I wouldn't have to answer the question that often. I'd be like, <laughs> they're like, I know my stack and reach. Will it fit? And like, you know, probably at least half the people can just read the chart. And then the other half of the people have to be like, oh, here's your cell on the chart. No problem. Like, yeah, exactly. I, I'm just lazy. <laughs> um, you often hear bike frame uh, manufacturers talk about how a frame is long and low or short and tall. Can the right arrow bars make more frames a possibility for a particular rider? Yes and no. It's a little more yes okay. than no in my opinion, but that'll change depending on who you're talking to. So if you can get the coordinates where you want them to, then yes, technically your body is in the same position. However, if the frame underneath you is in a weirder position, that can change the handling of the bike. And so when I say more yes than no, it's because I think people vastly overestimate the handling effects of very minor changes to stack and reach of a frame. Yeah. Um, so generally, I think it's it's a safe bet. And like also, cyclists, the human body and the human brain, we're very, very capable of adapting to those minor changes in geometry. Okay. Um, you know, like the difference between a size small and a size large is going to be like maybe two inches of reach, right? Um, it's not that much. So if you get your body in the identical position, generally, I think you will, you will figure out how to handle the bike and it'll all work out just fine for you. But you know, that's not a, that's not a cure all, but uh, what do you guys think about that? Um, Chris, what do you think? Uh, it's not really, I don't design that, but as an athlete, um, I I think if if there's enough movement, yeah. I mean, to some extent, for sure. I mean, have you ever ridden a small bike, like a bike that was too small for you with a little more reach on the handlebars? Like generally, yeah, I think you can you can stretch I, it out a bit. I actually just watched a, a video by GCN. Uh, they did this study where they they took the same riders, uh, same bike, and they went from like a a sixty mil stem all the way up to a hundred and forty or fifty mil stem. Yeah, 
and they talked about the differences in handling and how it affected it. And it wasn't drastic. Um, so yeah, you know, obviously I think the best advice is get the right bike, you know, get yeah. the right bike that fits. And obviously I think, but there, I will say there have been many times where I've had an aero bike or aero bars. Uh, so I've had a bike with aero bars and the bars just won't do what I need them to. And right. that's the most frustrating thing in the world. It's like, that's the thing. Gosh. That's yeah. No, that's why and I'm, I'm looking obsessed at it going, with aero bars. Why is there not a bolt there? And right. why can't I just move that? Or why isn't there, uh, I go to the website and I'm like, I just need a, st- a riser or I need a, an adapter and it's not made. And I'm like, come on guys. Like that seems like the most yeah. basic part to make. So the fact that your bars give you this ultimate, um, flexibility is pretty cool one question i do have about your bars yeah the hoods always stay low right so if you go up in the pads the hoods are always low no so we also include four arrow matched stem spacers so that you can raise the bar oh that's brilliant because i had Thank a you. bike once a uh, cannondale slice rs and that thing <laughs> there's right. no st- yeah no right. stack in the stem yeah. So in order to get my position, I actually, my body went lower to go to the hoods. Right. So coming yeah. out of the aero bars, I got lower. Yeesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, that which made low. riding yeah. that bike for 80 to 100 miles like the worst. If you're just on a training ride, it just yeah. was... Ugh. Right, so, right. Yep. No, yeah, they're they're aero matched and they like allow pass through of cables and the monopost and like everything. Nice. So it's just, yeah, they're just like round spacers, except they look exactly like the bottom of the Alpha 1 stem. Yeah, perfect. All right, extensions. You talked earlier about the S-shape extensions Ooh, yeah. that you became obsessed about. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. Hand position, arm position, how they relate to comfort and aerodynamics. What are your thoughts on them? Ooh, love it. And that stuff is always changing. <laughs> no, like honestly, like you think you have the answer to these things. And then over time, like people do lots of studies and there's lots of great data and there's lots of great fitters out there who are trying very creative things. And like... I've seen a trend towards a lot more riders doing higher hands positions, both for comfort comfort and aero reasons and good fitters helping them get there. Okay. Um, I really like high hands positions, but some of them you have to test. So like we went to the tunnel and tested with Matt Russell and we tried his default position, which was about five degrees of arm pad tilt. And so it's not the, the exact degree from any point on his body, like his elbow to his, you know, front index finger knuckle or something but it's mm-hmm. just the pads were at five degrees angle and he had our uh, gamma 110s on there i'm sorry okay. uh, gamma one okay uh so at five degrees he was good at 10 degrees he was awful at 15 degrees he was much much better and then at 17 degrees he was the best of the bunch so you have to test these things because you just don't know it's crazy hey? yeah it was wild um so, I mean, generally, if you don't have the ability to test, the answer is do whatever's the most comfortable, whatever you'll stay in arrow the longest. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about extension shapes all the time. We're prototyping extension shapes all the time. I'm also prototyping cups frequently um, because I think this higher hands trend is a good one. Um, and to some extent, slightly longer reach, just increasing slightly that angle between your um, upper arm and your torso yep. uh, and then kind of like dropping the elbow a little bit you kind of maintain your body position but your your shoulders kind of crumple in a little bit it makes your body smaller but it's more comfortable for a lot of athletes but what you want is really good forearm support and so yep. we're prototyping different cups we've we've teased a bunch of these on facebook but uh, stuff with rear support so that it cups around the back yeah, of your elbow. Like TJ Tolkson's cups. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So he was like the first guy, I think, to prototype those. He's been using those for like 10 years. But um, are you 3D printing? Yeah, sometimes. So not, I mean, See, not for you production. make a product that's small enough to 3D print. It's really hard to 3D print a wheel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have um, now like meter squared 3D printers. Yeah. For half a million bucks or whatever it Ooh. is. Well, not the printer, just get the print. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> yeah. But Yeah, we we yeah, for sure, definitely. There's we've looked at some we three D printed some other fun stuff that we're looking at and uh yeah, it's three D printers are the way to go if you if you can do them. I mean the first uh, Omni sure. prototype was a three D print. That's a mess, but really? yeah, you can do it. I mean sometimes like so for that print we had to make it in a couple pieces and yeah, then and you put, move, them you put them together. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any general advice on arm position 
I know you've said, you know, you kind of have to test and that's kind of been our theory, but you said what's comfortable. Yeah. Um, let's say you're comfortable in a number of positions. You're not really affected by comfort. Would you, so you're saying you like the high hand position, wide elbows, narrow elbows. What do you think? If you say arm position doesn't affect your comfort, you're either lying or you haven't tried enough arm positions. <laughs> 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 they, they make a difference for sure. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people do well uh, comfort wise with like 10, 12, 15 degrees of arm tilt because you're kind of falling yep. into the bars. Um, you definitely need the right pads for it. So like our pads, we made, we make them with a textured neoprene. I don't like the cloth covers that most people use because uh, mm -hmm. they like make you slide around. And uh, especially if you're tilted up, that's not so hot. Um, yep. So get the right pads. I mean, there's there's other good pads out there, but I don't know of anyone else using just textured neoprene right now, which I think is awesome. Um, okay. But yeah, I think generally something like that, 10 to 15 degrees of tilt makes makes you kind of fall into the bars. And then I always like narrow hands. Like I want your hands to be together if I'm helping you do a bike fit. Um, and then your elbows as narrow as are comfortable for you. Cause that almost yep. exclusively makes people faster, but some people can't do it without being uncomfortable. So Jonathan Lee from trainer road, uh, those guys did that TT and they went to Jim Manton for the fit. Yeah. And he found that taking his hands from holding each extension to putting one hand on top of the other was yeah. one of his biggest gains actually. So it's interesting you say that. Yeah, no, I've heard that a lot too, but generally I just want your hands close together because it helps your elbows come together as well. Ah, um, yeah, yeah. like, I mean, if you just sit, like sit in the TT position and then try and put your elbows together and your hands apart, it's like super uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 Um, but some people try and do weird stuff like that. Oh yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I've, I've read some of the quotes on your, you know, the alpha one and it, it's kind of already saying it's the future of aero bars, but <laughs> if you had to predict the next future of aero bars, what do you foresee? Do you see any big changes, anything that you see happening? I mean, the new look ergo thing is pretty cool. They have like this extensions, these extensions that like they go in and out and then the terminus of the extension where your hand grabs is like its own independent pivot that you can change the angle on, which is kind of cool. What is that um, called? Ergo, A-E-R-G-O. Look ergo, A-E-R-G-O. I've not heard of this. I'm looking this up. Oh, so that's definitely a cool idea for extension shape. Like the guys from Speed Bar make an integrated solution that's really nice because it hugs your whole arm, but that has mm -hmm. to be made one at a time and they charge like three grand and that's just the extensions and cups. Um, Whoa. Uh, so those things are cool. I But the, those look bars use a traditional double spacer stack system, um, yep, okay. which I think is just unequivocally the past. Like, yep continuous monopost adjustment I think is absolutely like I, I would not ride another bike without something like that um, okay. right now the only you know the only bikes that have that are the Cervelo P5X Cervelo P3X Cervelo P5 disc and any bike with Alpha 1 on it um, and Alpha 1 Alpha 1 will fit on any bike or uh, most bikes. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can slap it on, you know, your standard double diamond frame. Like you probably couldn't put it on Chris's BMC cause that has a whole integrated front end. Yes. But as long as it has a standard front end, then yes, alpha one works. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. All right. The famous Watt point question. If you've listened to the show, you know what it is. So <laughs> oh, yeah. the idea is if the listener takes all of the advice by the given by the expert on the show, how many Watts is that worth? So let's, let's do this. Let's take a rider with uh, disc brakes, an outdated frame uh, limited by UCI rules, and a poor fitting aero bar. And then you get them on, uh, you know, aero brakes with a, a, a frame that has no UCI rules or regulations that apply to it, and a great fitting aero bar. How many watts is that worth? Okay, so I've, I've thought about this, but <laughs> I need to know what you mean by poorly fitting aero bar. Because if we're saying the rider's fit is changing between these two bikes, then... Geez, the answer could be like 40 watts, like okay. easily, like Easy. okay. easily. Like, yeah. I mean, Jim Manton helped fit uh, Tim O'Donnell last year, and this was just exact same bike, exact same parts. He was on his speed concept, and then they did some stuff to his speed concept, and Jim says he found him like 15 watts. Wow. Finding TO 15 watts is pretty awesome. Right? 
Yeah. yeah. You guys so, already, su- yeah, wow. I'm saying you make all those equipment differences and then you actually fit him properly on a bar that allows you to iterate the fit over the runs. Yeah, 40 watts, no question. All right, that's good. I love, love that it. everyone gets nervous about the watt point question. Like so many guests are like, "Oh man, I don't know." This is because they know it's like the question on the well, show. But it's like yeah. designing a wind tunnel study because you're asking basically to say your protocol for these questions, and then people are going to pick apart your protocol, and you want it to be defensible. So, absolutely, yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit Sorry. about tri rig. So, uh, for the man who loves making parts better, uh, what other parts of the bike are in need of improvement right now? Huh. Right now, nobody, very few people make good arm cups. Okay. Uh, I care a lot about arm cups. Like I said, we prototype them a lot. We're working on stuff. People don't make great arm cups. Um, hmm. There's always room for improvement in the aero bar system. Like I said, I'm just like obsessed with these things. So there, <laughs> yeah, there yeah. will never be the perfect aero bar. Like right now, I'm really, really happy with Alpha 1, but... There will never be the perfect one. There's always going to be improvements there. Okay. Um, when you started TriRig, did you have any idea you'd end up where you are now? No. I mean, I started TriRig as a review site, as like a consumer reports type thing. Um, and yeah. so I, I never imagined I would make hardware. And now that's like the vast majority of what we do. And the review stuff is is kind of minor. Yep. And cool. is can you talk about any big next steps for TriRig? Anything you can share? Hmm. Well, I hinted at something earlier that yes, I won't revisit. Um, we're, we're always there's always like three or four things in the hopper coming next, and so I mean, your mind have... amazes me. You're all, you've always, and I will <laughs> say this: I when you previewed the Omni to us before you released it, I was blown away at how many small minor integrations and like really cool, just clean finishes you put on that bike. Like the way Thank everything you. works together is just like poetic, almost. It's like it was yeah. amazing. So I that. Nick, <laughs> Yeah. Nick reaches out randomly and he's like, hey, I kind of have this like project I'd kind of like to show you guys and get your thoughts on. I'm thinking it's like a, you know, like a small thing. And all of a sudden he's like, here's my project. And I'm like, it's a whole bike. <laughs> Not only is it a whole bike, but you like completely change most of the things that I've seen on normal bikes. <laughs> yeah. Man, like, you, I'm like, okay, here you, we go. You, yeah, you think have, through, man. It's impressive. You guys are making me blush. You have to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, awesome. you can buy us lunch in Kona. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It might be your year anyway. <laughs> and yes. then uh, where can listeners, so where can listeners find out more about TriRig? I mean, TriRig.com is the site. We are TriRig across virtually all social media, although I don't post, you know, super prolifically, at least on Instagram or anything. We're mostly yeah. on Facebook and then that populates to Twitter as well. But um, yeah, TriRig.com. Cool. Awesome. Well, man, awesome. thanks for coming on the show. Uh, it's always been a, you know, every time we get together, it's fun. There's always stuff to talk about. It's great to have you on just to get another manufacturer's standpoint. And I think I think that this is a bit of a different episode for us, but I, th- I hope listeners enjoy just hearing two people kind of talk about the industry and, yeah. and some of the things that we think about when designing products. And if any of the listeners have questions or comments that we they would like us to expand upon, uh, John and I have actually been thinking about doing some more episodes on just our world and the wind tunnel and the stuff that we've learned from that. So be interesting to see if people will be interested in that. So thanks Nick for coming on, kind of setting that uh, tone for us and uh, we'll see you next probably in Kona. Hey. Yeah, man, dude. And if, uh, if your listeners didn't like this episode, I don't really care. Cause I had a great time talking with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Always do. Um, <laughs> Always great catching up. Yeah, yeah, man. Thank you so much. All right, man. All right, Take guys. care. Yep. See Bye. You. Hey, this is Chris with flow. When we're not producing this podcast, our team at Flow is designing some of the fastest carbon fiber bicycle wheels in the world. As a thank you for being a listener of our podcast, Faster by Flow, we wanted to offer you 20% off your next purchase of wheels at flowcycling.com. Head over to our website and pick up a set of wheels to make you faster at your next race or ride. Simply use coupon code PODCAST, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, in all uppercase letters when checking out to get 20% off your order. Thanks again for listening to Faster. We hope you enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode 33, where we interview muscle oxygen sensor manufacturers, Human. During this episode, we'll discuss what muscle oxygen is, how it's different from power and heart rate, 
and how you can use it to become a faster cyclist. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L-O-C-Y-C-L-I-N-G.com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe. Bye.